Welcome to the 700 Club. Thanks so much for joining us. Well, all of us are paying an extra $175 a month. That's what we are now spending on housing, groceries, and gasoline. With no relief in sight, that beca could become the new normal well into 2022. Well, the ongoing slowdown at the nation's largest port has a chokehold on the global supply chain, increasing shortages and driving up prices. So what's being done to fix the problem? CBN's Brody Carter brings us a first-hand look. Here at the Port of Virginia, they're already soaking up some of that congestion that we're seeing in the West Coast. They're operating very efficiently, and they're hopeful to keep that cargo and turn it into long-term business. If you take your car and you run it 100 miles an hour every day, um, that car begins to show wear and tear. The industry is being run every day at 100 miles an hour. As many as 73 container ships have been waiting to unload goods at the ports of Long Beach and Los Angeles over the last week. The largest ports in the nation now a chokehold to the global supply chain. The warehouses are full. The truck capacity is being soaked up because there's so much cargo that needs to be moved. L.A. Long Beach processes about 10 million shipping containers each year. In comparison, all the major ports on the East Coast process a little more than 8 million. And the ships keep coming. The supply chain bottleneck is driving inflation. Store shelves are bare, and you've likely felt the impact in your wallet. Inflation takes its worst toll on those who are at the lowest ladders of income and wealth, poor people. And so uh, for those who are well-to-do, you know, it's just not really an issue. But for the middle class and those who are in lower income groups, that's where the toll is taken. And, you know, it's like they can't get a break. Inflation is up more than 5% just this year. The typical American household now spending an extra $175 more each month on housing, groceries and gas. And it could be the new normal for months. On a 12-month basis, the inflation rate um, will remain high uh, into next year because of what's already happened. But uh, I expect improvement uh, by the end of, by the middle to end of next year, second second half of next year. Second half of 2020. Major companies are charging more because of rising costs like Nestle, Unilever, and Procter and Gamble. The U.S. Postal Service and other shipping companies have added new facilities, machines, and seasonal workers in an attempt to avoid the brunt of bottlenecks come Christmas. It's going to take some patience. It's going to take some understanding. And I would ask them if they know someone in the port industry, thank them because the, those folks are working hard and they are working hard for the American economy. The strain in the supply chain, it'll endure well past COVID-19, well into 2022. Harris says they just hope they can contain the workload that they've already taken on to help alleviate the problems we're seeing on the West Coast. I'm Brody Carter, CBN News. Well, our CBN News financial editor, Drew Park Parkill, is with us. And so, Drew, uh, what are the causes for inflation other than supply chain? We seem to be focused politically on supply chain, but isn't energy a, big, a bigger component? Yeah, there are various other things, Gordon. Um, for one thing, there's a long-term price cycle that just runs through the economy. I want to show you a chart of interest rates I put together. It's very, very simple. But in 1940, now these are three-month T-bills, short-term rates. On average for the year, short-term interest rates ran at 0%, okay? But then inflation came in, and by 1981, they were up over 14% in 40 years. Then over the next 40 years, we saw inflation coming down, and so last year, they were back down close to 0%. So there's a natural price cycle, and it's giving signs that we're going to see the economy uh, inflation start heading back up again. I mean, there's no question about that. There are some other things as well, like... Uh, businesses are asking the president to hold off on this vaccine mandate because a lot of people just don't want the vaccine so they won't work, and that creates more problems. Well, are, are we looking at what we all experienced in the 70s, which is stagflation? Yes, at least in the short term. The GDP numbers for the third quarter of this year are coming out Thursday morning. They're expected to show a dramatic slowdown. Now, it won't be like the 70s, but let me define what stagflation is. What it really, it's a combination of stagnation and inflation. It just means high inflation and a stagnant economy. You hit the nail on the head, Gordon. In 1973 and 75, this was thought to be impossible. 
inflation was running around 11% or so, and unemployment hit 9%. And then a few years later, in 1980, unemployment was over seven and a half, was around seven and a half percent, and inflation was 13%. That was thought to be impossible. Now, we're probably going to see some of that again on a smaller scale, but it's definitely on the way. It's definitely, we're living in it now because the economy is slowing down while prices are picking up, and some prices, of course, more than others. Well, how's this going to play out politically? It didn't. It didn't work for Jimmy Carter. So, so how's it going to play uh, in the election cycles? It's already playing out. You know, everybody was talking a few months ago uh, about Joe Biden's social spending and climate change bill going to be three and a half trillion. Well, then there was polling done that showed in swing districts and key congressional districts, people were just afraid of this because they thought big government spending, high deficits were going to lead to meet even more inflation. So they said, we don't want anything to do with this. And then on a dime, the White House and the Democrats started saying, oh, it's going to cost nothing. It's going to cost nothing. And so they backed off a lot from that. Now we have the other problem is, is that the taxation side of it is being changed, which I know we're going to talk to here and uh, talk about in a few seconds. But Cinema and Mansion didn't like these high corporate tax rates. Now they're talking about this billionaire's tax, which may be unconstitutional. So there's still concern that they're going to run deficits, despite what the Democrats are saying. And with the Fed pouring money into the system, that is definitely a problem. And if it stays, if we keep this through the next election cycle, it's going to be a massive problem for the Democrats. All right. Well, Drew, thanks for being with us. I don't see any end to the deficits. We've been running them for a long time, ever since. Um, the, the second Bush. The, these are incredible deficits that we have and an incre incredible national debt. Well, turning now to the massive spending bill in Washington with a billionaire's tax on the table, Democrats are still haggling over how to lower the price tag. Charlie and Aaron has more from the CBN Newsroom. Democrats are struggling, Gordon, to keep their pledge to pay for the nearly $2 trillion bill. Arizona Democrat Senator Kirsten Sinema knocked down a proposal to raise taxes on corporations and individuals. Now that so-called billionaires tax, a proposal to tax unrealized capital gains on people with $1 billion in assets, is circulating. While not all Democrats support that idea, West Virginia moderate Joe Manchin indicates he could support that plan. I'm open to any type of thing that makes people pay that's not paying now. So people that don't report income like you and I do and earned income, there has to be a way for them to pay their fair share. Manchin, however, is still troubled by the plan's costs, especially expanding Medicare and Medicaid coverage. Negotiations also still underway over climate change initiatives, paid family leave, among other items. The president is hoping to have an agreement by the time he departs for a global climate summit later this week. Well, an advisory panel meets today to decide whether to recommend the FDA approve Pfizer's COVID vaccine for children. The White House is ready to ship 65 million pediatric doses of the Pfizer shots. That could happen as soon as next week, once the CDC gives final approval. Pfizer says trial data shows that the vaccine, which is one third an adult dose, is nearly 91 percent effective against symptomatic illness in children ages 5 to 11. And extreme weather is rocking the U.S. from coast to coast. Heavy storms bringing flooding in the west and tornadoes in the Midwest. Meanwhile, a nor'easter is headed up the east coast. Dale Hurd has that story. A day after the west coast saw record storms and then a cluster of tornadoes struck the Midwest, the first nor'easter of the season is taking aim along the east coast with up to eight inches of rain and winds up to 60 miles per hour. New York and New Jersey have already declared states of emergency and flash flood watchers are in effect from the New Jersey shore to Boston. Heavy rain this morning across uh, uh, northern and central uh, New Jersey. This storm really starts to strengthen, and that's when we're going to have even more extreme uh, impacts, especially across eastern New England and around the Boston area. New York City officials are urging people living in basements to be on alert after 11 people died in flooded basements last month from Hurricane Ida. Today's storm comes after a historic so-called atmospheric river slammed into the West Coast, sending mud, trees and boulders crashing down on this California highway. This big rig was blown onto its side on the Richmond-San Rafael Bridge. 
Elsewhere in California's Bay Area, neighborhoods underwater. My whole garage is up to my kneecaps. Everything is floating around. Parts of I-80 had to be shut down because of heavy snow. The coast of Washington state saw its strongest storm on record. The Midwest was also feeling nature's wrath. In Chicago, winds from a separate system created 12-foot waves on Lake Michigan. Look at this strong tornado. That storm dropped at least 13 tornadoes in Missouri and Illinois, one of which destroyed John and Joellen Duncan's home northeast of Kansas City. We have a basement, but there wasn't time. Once you see the tornado, there's not time to run to the basement. And if we'd have tried, we'd have probably been killed. But the good news for Californians is water, large volumes of water, much needed after the summer drought. The Lake Oroville Reservoir in Northern California has risen more than 20 feet. Dale Hurd, CBN News. Certainly sending prayers to those impacted by these storms, Gordon. Uh, we need to do more than pray. We need to come together and say, how can we help those who have been devastated by these disasters? We're getting hit all across the nation, whether it's in New England or Chicago or the West Coast. Uh, and one of the great things about America is that when we see people in trouble, we band together to help them. So um, kudos to us. Let's put aside all our political differences for a moment and focus on uh, we've got to get the, through this together. Well, the chaos at our southern border continues to build as more and more illegal immigrants flood into our country. One European nation has taken strong action to protect their border, even in the face of intense global criticism. So what could the U.S. learn from their example? Well, Gen CBN's Jennifer Wishon traveled to Hungary to find out firsthand. This is the border between Serbia and Hungary. This is the fence often referred to as a wall that draws so much criticism from Western Europe and much of the world. It went up six years ago as hundreds of thousands of migrants from Syria and other countries stormed through this Central European country on their way to Germany. A scene that's repeated itself. Today, a warning broadcast in seven languages. Approaching the border fence or touching it can cause injury and pain. I urge you to refrain from committing the crime. Border police say it's still mainly young men trying to cross the border, often approaching the fence in military formations. Hundreds of migrants attempt to cross each day. Riot teams remain on standby, and now officials are bracing for another wave from Afghanistan. Around 400 Afghans, including the family members, are now in Hungary, and we definitely will take care of them. But here there's a full stop. We will not receive anyone else. We will protect our border. We will withstand the pressure. And we will continue to stick to our own right to make our own decision whom we allow to enter the territory of our country and with whom we are ready to live together. We're getting an aerial view of the border. Hungarian officials tell us in the summer of 2015, 150,000 refugees were walking across the border every month. They walked miles across a great expanse of quiet farmland, shocking residents. A lot of there. There were a lot of damage in the agriculture. Well. There were some farms, you know, and just, just went into the houses. It was very much irritating to the people living here. General Bakandi George, Hungary's chief national security advisor, was waiting for us when we landed at the border. Could you have? have curbed this problem without offense. In a country with a history of oppressive occupations and a post-World War I treaty that dramatically reduced its size, Hungary is unapologetic about preserving its culture built on the foundation of Christianity. Migration already brought forward a huge cultural clash and will bring even more.
Under Soviet rule, Pastor Nemeth Sandor was forced to practice his faith underground. Today, he leads the largest evangelical church in the country. I believe it's a tragic mistake. Hogy pálapostolnak az örökséget elték az Ornál Európa. Waste the heritage of the Apostle Paul. Isten pálapostolt Európába küldte. God sent the Apostle Paul. Ő rakta le Európában a kereszténységnek az alap. He laid the foundations of Christianity on this continent. Senior Hungarian officials tell CBN News it's simple. They don't want a multicultural society. We think that migration is harmful. It creates parallel societies, it, uh, you know, uh, people losing their roots and their traditions. Also, promoting migration gives uh, room to uh, trafficking uh, organizations and uh, have also many uh, uh, security concerns. ASBE and other officials say while they're not opposed to legal migration, the government seeks to help people where they are, rather than transporting them to a foreign culture. And in the face of criticism from the European Union and much of the world, Hungary sees securing its borders as key to its survival. The Judeo-Christian revelation and, and values are something I am willing to fight for at the moment. Jennifer Wishon, CBN News, reporting from Hungary's southern border. Well, we have lessons to learn here. One is that if you don't control migration and you don't control immigration, then what happens to your national identity? Uh, Hungary has taken some rather, in the world's term, extreme measures with that border. Uh, the warnings that there could be physical harm if you even come near it and touch it. Uh, but that is the reality they're living with, faced with a huge Muslim immigration problem coming out of the civil war in Syria. So, uh, and now we're going to have another wave with the collapse of Afghanistan. Uh, so they're, they're going to continue to struggle. For us here in the United States, it's not so much cultural identity as can we absorb two million people. That's the, the projected number of people that are crossing the border just this uh, fiscal year, if you will, April 1, starting in April 1 and going forward. Uh, we're, we're, we're having unprecedented numbers, and these are the numbers that are actually reported. These are the people that are caught and then uh, released into our country. Uh, how can our social systems take care of them? Uh, how can our job market take care of them? And the answer is we can't. Uh, Two million is it going to overwhelm everything. So at what point in time does our administration say, we're here to enforce the law? At what point in time do they recognize this is a crisis? They may have to reverse some things politically, but uh, our national uh, integrity is, is at stake. A nation that can't control its own borders is no longer really a nation. Uh, you're going to have floods of migrants, and that's exactly what we're seeing on our southern border today. You know, one of the other things that you see in that piece that Hungary seems to have been able to to hang on to that we seem to be losing is an understanding of the value of their culture, their traditions, and their faith. And when that starts to wobble, then everything seems... But hasn't that been wobbling for some yes, time? Yes, it has, you know, sadly. When, it has. Um, when under the Bush administration, we allowed Sharia law to be yeah. put in the constitution of Iraq and Afghanistan. And, and I'm, I'm going, you've got to be kidding. Uh, have we abandoned our principles that democracy works, that freedom of religion works, that freedom of speech works, that freedom of assembly works? You don't have that under Sharia. So why would you ever have an American force uh, put that into their constitution? It just made no sense to me. Yeah. Have, we, have we lost that bedrock uh, of what it means to be American. Yeah, it does seem to be waning, but there is a... There's hope. <laughs> There's hope, always hope, right? Hope. <laughs> Tiffany went off the rails at a very young age. At 15, she was using cocaine on a regular basis. From there, it was ecstasy, then crystal meth and crack cocaine. Tiffany was on a fast track to crash and burn. So what happened instead? You're about to find out. 
The rave scene became my life. The people, um, the excitement, the flashing, the laser lights, all of those things, I just became very much enslaved to. As a young child, I didn't have any um, acknowledgement of God. I had heard of God before, but I didn't know God. As I was getting older, I wanted to fit in. And so to make new friends, I would do pretty much anything to be accepted or to fit in. And by the age of 10, I was stealing my parents' cigarettes. By the age of 11, I started smoking pot. By the age of 12, I was stealing Xanax and pills. 13 came along and I tried acid for the very first time. So it was always on to the next big drug. By the time I was 15, I was using cocaine on a regular basis. 16 came along and I was introduced to ecstasy. 17 went to crystal meth. And then if I couldn't get crystal meth, crack cocaine was always available. So I started smoking crack. I always felt like a misfit and like I was always searching for something when the rave scene came into my life, I felt like that was it. I went out probably four nights a week. That was my church, it was my religion. Whenever I was 16, I had OD'd in my room. I was too scared to call 911 because I didn't want to go to jail. And I was too scared to tell my parents that I was OD'ing on drugs in my room. And so I just grabbed my poetry book and I started writing, take me to the place by the bay where I will stay if that is okay. 18 came along and I got arrested for the very first time. Six months into my probation, I got arrested again. I had a court appointed lawyer that actually really cared about me and she fought for me and got me in rehab in an all women's rehab facility for three months instead of going to jail for two years. The people there said that if we were on good behavior, that we could take a walk down to the park. The entrance to the park, it was like an archway. Above the archway, there was a sign that said, by the bay. Immediately, the Lord brought up in my remembrance of that poem, and he was answering that prayer to the T. I knew in my heart that I wanted more from life, but I didn't really know how to go about that. And towards the end of the three months, I was honestly terrified to leave rehab because I was scared of the world. Literally, the first day that I got out of rehab, I had people calling me, asking me if I wanted to get high with them to celebrate the fact that I was leaving rehab. Fell back into those old habits, maybe not as bad with harder drugs, but I turned to drinking. On average, seven to 10 shots and four to five beers uh, in one, a couple of hours. I started getting so sick. I would be throwing up, vomiting, I would dread it but I couldn't stop. Right before Halloween time, me and a group of friends had decided to dress up and we went to a club and I was very intoxicated. These people had come up to me and they said that they were going to go buy me a drink. And so she hands me this drink and then 15 minutes later, literally it hit me so hard. The next morning I woke up and I didn't know where I was. My mom ended up having to come and pick me up later that day because I couldn't drive. I just didn't want to live anymore. Like, I didn't have anything to live for. That next morning, my mom walks into my room and she invited me to go to church with her. And so I went to church that day and he was talking about how he was saved from cocaine addiction at 22 years old. And I thought to myself, my pastor used to do cocaine, you know? And I was shocked. All of a sudden it was like, Jesus just turned on the light. I prayed that prayer of salvation and I said yes to Jesus. All of the weight 
and all of the sadness and all of the depression just lifted off of me and I literally felt lighter. I started serving in, in several ministries. I was reading in Exodus uh, 15 and I jumped down to verse 20 and it, it says that then Miriam the prophetess, Aaron's sister, took up her timbrels and led the ladies in song and dance. I just remember pausing and just stopping and looking up and saying, are you telling me to start a dance ministry? <laughs> what is it called? And it was just boom, immediately, heart of dance. I had laid down dancing for many years after I got saved because it was very triggering at times for me and it would kind of bring me back into these places that were uncomfortable. God brought me through a process of healing and repackaged dancing and gave it back to me in a whole brand new uh, way that was even better than before. It is a ministry that focuses on evangelism to club kids. We share the gospel with them and show them how to dance and have fun without drugs. If there is someone out there that doesn't know Jesus, um, he is the cure and the answer to loneliness and to depression. I definitely think that God can do exactly what he did for me for anyone. Oh, he can. He can for anyone who's willing to receive him. You know, you don't have to do all kinds of things. You don't have to get good enough. You don't have to, you don't have to do anything. In fact, God wants you to come just the way you are because you understand that he is able to give you something you can't get on your own. Forgiveness of sin, yes, but Jesus said, I've come that they might have life and have it abundantly. Are you having abundant life? If your life's not abundant, then you're not connected to the only one who can give you that. You know, when we're young, I, I don't know what it is because it seems so foolish as we, as we age and we look back at the choices that we made, but there's something about being at where it seems to be happening. You know, it's really about filling that emptiness inside of us. All the drinking, all the, all the drugs, all the relationships, all the, the whole rave scene is almost a cry from inside of us. Please let life mean something. And we go to all of these places that just send us home emptier and emptier and emptier until we come to the end of ourselves. And God waits. The creator of the universe waits. Isn't that an astonishing thing? Waits for you and for me to turn and say, God, please help me. I, I can't do this on my own. I don't know how to do this on my own, but there's something inside of me that knows there's more. And you know what? If you have that feeling, you're right. There is more. You can see it in Tiffany's face, can't you? I mean, when she's sitting on that Bay Bridge and she's got that smile on her face, there's a peace in her. There's a, a, a sense of purpose in her, intention and understanding that she matters and that life is a gift. If you don't have that, you can have it right now. It's that simple. You know, sometimes we make something that's so simple seem so complicated. Just stop what you're doing. Say, I'm done. I'm done doing it my way. I'm done letting all these people around me influence who I am and what I do and where I go. Right now, Jesus, I'm coming to you and I am saying, God, I am a sinner in need of a savior. There is no other name under heaven by which men may be saved. Call his name, say it, Jesus. I want you to come into my life, into my heart, into the midst of my mess. Oh God, would you forgive me? Would you forgive my sins as you've promised you would? Would you be the savior of my soul? Would you be the friend that I long for? Would you be the one who fills my emptiness with abundant living? I don't understand how all that happens, but I know I need you. 
So come into my heart and my life today and fill me. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Teach me how to live for you. Teach me how to think differently. I commit my life to you and I give it all to you, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And I'm asking you to make something out of my life that matters. Thank you for the gift of eternal life. I receive it today. In Jesus' name, amen. That's the matchless thing, the name above all names, Jesus, the one who died for you, the one who makes it possible for you to come to the Father. If you've prayed that prayer with me today, will you call our toll-free number because I want to send you this packet. It's called A New Day. What do you do now that you've prayed this prayer? How do you follow Jesus? What does that even look like? This is yours for free. The number's free. It's 1-800-700-7000. Call. We will get A New Day out to you right away. Ask for the New Day packet when you call. The UN Security Council is set to address the coup in Sudan today. Monday, Sudan's military leaders took control of the country, arresting the prime minister and dissolving the government. That is, thousands of people take to the streets in protest. In the Sudanese capital, reports of violence and gunshots. At least three reported dead and 80 injured. The coup comes just two years after the ouster of former President Omar al-Bashir, putting on hold the people's hopes of a democratically elected government. The Biden administration freezing $700 million in aid intended for Sudan. Here in the U.S., an Army Major General who was adopted as a child served for 20 years before finding out that his biological family was closer than he realized. Robert Edmondson reunited with his two half-brothers at Fort Knox in Kentucky. One of them also serves in the Army. If I could, could sum it up in one word, that one word would be love. A number of emotions came to mind. Number one, I was raised as an only child. So I immediately had siblings. Edmondson's fellow soldier, now a younger brother, served in the same division, pledged the same fraternity, and get this, both their sons share the same birthday. Pretty awesome. You can also get the latest from CBN News by going to our website at cbnnews.com. Well, while much of the world celebrates Halloween, the Christian church calendar commemorates Reformation Day on October 31st. In 1517, Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses on the Wittenberg Castle church door and with the stroke of a pen, changed the world. Now for the first time in 4K streaming, CBN Films brings the story of Martin Luther to life. Martin Luther, the Reformation, can be yours for a gift of any dollar amount. Just call our toll-free number, 1-800-700-7000, or visit cbn.com slash Martin Luther. Order today and get instant streaming access in 4K on CBN Family. And we'll also send you a DVD copy of Martin Luther, the Reformation, for your gift of any dollar amount. To order your DVD, call 1-800-700-7000 or visit cbn.com slash Martin Luther. Gordon? Well, two cousins living in Thailand. One is a Buddhist, one is a Christian. And both of them love watching CBN's Superbook. Now they have even more in common, all because of a cartoon. Take a look. Nine-year-old Bam was thrilled when she was able to move near her cousin, Shalom. I was so excited. We played games together. We went biking, running, and swimming. I am so happy to live here. Bam was a Buddhist, Shalom a Christian. One day, Shalom invited her cousin to watch a Superbook episode at her church about Naaman the leper. Naaman had leprosy. His servant told him about Elisha. Elisha told Naaman to wash in the Jordan River seven times. After Naaman did that, the leprosy was gone. When Bam came home, she told her grandma, who was also a Buddhist, about Naaman's miracle. Grandma asked Bam to pray for her. Grandma's legs had been hurting. She could barely walk. I prayed, Father God, thank you for today, and please heal Grandma's legs completely. Bam prayed for me, and the next morning, I could walk normally again. The pain was gone, and it hasn't come back. Bam continued to go to Sunday school with her cousin, 
After a few weeks, they watched the Superbook episode about Samuel. That's when Bam decided to pray to become a Christian. I felt like God was calling me just like he called Samuel. I prayed with my teacher to invite Jesus to come into my heart. Every morning before school, Bam prayed with her brother and sisters. After they went to Sunday school and watched Superbook, they prayed to become Christians too. I'm so happy that my siblings came to watch Superbook with me. Now, they also believe in Jesus, and we are getting to know him together. Meanwhile, Bam's grandma has also prayed to become a Christian. Because of Superbook, I've come to know God. My grandma is healed, and my whole family believes in Jesus. Thank you for creating Superbook for us. A thank you goes to you if you're a member of the 700 Club. You're a part of everything CBN does around the world. You're a part of Superbook, you're a part of Operation Blessing, you're a part of CBN International, and you're part of this show. We're a lot more than just a TV show. We want to help people, and especially we want to preach the gospel around the world. So if you're not a member, I encourage you to join. How much is it? Well, it's just $20 a month, 65 cents a day. We've got other levels, so if you are a member, consider increasing to 700 Club Gold, $40 a month. 1,000 Club is $1,000 a year, and that breaks out to $84 a month. And if you want to designate your gift into Superbook, we have a special club called the Superbook Club. And part of that is you'll get three copies of the newest episodes of Superbook for a recurring gift of $25 or more on a credit or debit card. Every four weeks, about, you'll receive a new Superbook episode or a Gizmo Go episode, and your account will be automatically debited $25. Join today. We'll send you three copies of our latest episode, Explorer 31, and it features Paul and the Unknown Gods, parts one and two. So if you'd like that, give us a call and say, I want to be part of the distribution cost, the translation cost, the production cost of Superbook. I want to join the Superbook Club. 1-800-700-7000. You can also join online at CBN.com. And here's an extra bonus. Superbook Club members can also stream all episodes, seasons one through five, absolutely free through either the Superbook app or the CBN Family app. So if you'd like to have your young ones watch it on a tablet, you can watch all five seasons. Rivers of tears, that's what poured out of Tracy Lambert's right eye. She tried eye drops, she changed makeup, she stopped using mascara. Nothing stopped her eye from watering. So how did she finally get relief? Take a look. Third grade teacher Tracy Lambert always enjoyed living on the Florida coast with her husband Chris and their two sons. Then one day, it was about 2018, I noticed that my eye was just starting to water. My husband and I were out for a walk and I was like, why is my eye watering? But I didn't think a whole lot of it at first because people's eyes do water from time to time. At first, Tracy chalked it up to seasonal allergies. Then more seasons came and went. My eye would be watering all throughout the year. It didn't matter if it was high pollen, low pollen. I tried changing my makeup. I tried wearing no mascara and I was troubleshooting and nothing seemed to really stop it. In fact, over the next 18 months, it got worse. The more I wiped, then the more it would kind of get sore on the corners. My third graders would say, what happened, Mrs. Lambert? Why are you crying? I would tell them, I was like, I'm not crying. My eyes are just watering. I'm a fixer. I try to solve problems. That's what I do. Uh, and this was one of those things that I just couldn't do anything about. It was just annoying. Even Tracy's eye doctor couldn't find anything wrong. The only thing he could do was give her eye drops. So I put the drops in and it made no difference. I just kind of chalked it up as this is just what it is. In September 2020, the family moved to Virginia Beach, Virginia, when Chris took a job at Regent University as vice president of advancement. Still, Tracy's symptoms remained. In all that time, she admits she never took it to God. I felt like that it was such an insignificant 
thing that was like, God's got bigger things to worry about other than Tracy's little eye watering. So no, I never went directly in prayer to say, God, please heal my eye. I never, I never did that. Then in March 2021, while watching the 700 Club, Tracy joined Pat and Wendy in prayer as they began giving words of knowledge. Someone with a, it's your right eye is just really weepy. It's like you're just crying nonstop and you're not sad. You're just having this, um, these tears come down. But um, the Lord's healing your eyes right now. So don't worry, God is touching you. Right eye be healed now in the name of Jesus. Oh my, that was actually for me. I was so, I was excited. And I said, I'm gonna claim this for me. And I reached up and I touched the side of my eye and I said, God, I think this is for me. So I held my hand there and then I felt it was kind of warm. And I had just complained that morning about my eye bothering me and tearing up to my husband. And then here it is like 9.30 that day. And then uh, it literally just dried up. Cause I got that phone call that day that said, Chris, you never believe what just happened. But she told me that story, and then it really kind of crystallized for us the, the depth and the breadth of God's caring for us. I am just ecstatic that she's healed. Both Tracy and Chris say they learned something that day. At the end of the day, God is listening, and he wants to, to be there with us. It still just gives me chills just thinking about it. I got a miracle. I mean, as tiny and as insignificant as that may be to anybody or even to myself, but I had my own little miracle and um, God cares about everything, even my watery eye. He hears, he sees, he understands. That's what the Bible says. God hears you. He sees you. He sees your need. He understands at a, a, a level that we don't understand. And here's how far he understands. He carried away every disease you've, you've ever had. And, and now start multiplying that by every person who's ever lived for all time. He carried away our sicknesses. This is why the Bible says he was marred more than any man, because he bore all of that in his body. These are incredible things, unbelievable things, but at the same time, this physically happened to Jesus. He took on all the sin of the whole world. He took on every single disease. There's nothing too hard or too little for him. He carried it all away. Our Savior, our Jesus, is touched by your infirmity. He knows because he's felt it. He's felt it every moment you felt it. These are truths that the Bible gives to us so that we can have the faith to believe that if he's carried it away, that if he bore it on the cross, I don't have to carry it anymore. I don't have to live with it anymore. I don't have to live with guilt and shame. I don't have to live with disease. He forgives all my iniquities and he heals all my disease. Now, what part of all is left out? You know, do you, do you get your own little private disease? No, no. Do you get your own, you get to hold on to, no. Whosoever, that can be you, whosoever would believe on him would not perish, but have everlasting life. These are incredible truths. This is the best news anyone has ever heard. You don't have to carry it anymore. You can leave it at the cross. You can give it all to him, and he will take care of it. Now, it's my favorite time of the show where we get to pray for you. Before we pray, we've got some other answers to prayer. Here's Jean-Pierre. He wrote in by email. For years, I've been dealing with sharp pain in my upper back when I exercised. On October 22, that's just a few days ago, I was watching the 700 Club. Terry said, there's someone with pain in the back, but it's not constant. 
I didn't know it was me at first, but after they finished praying, I grabbed 25-pound dumbbells in each hand and bent over to do rear lateral raise. I have no idea what that is, but it sounds painful. <laughs> after a couple of repetitions, I felt no pain. After 20 repetitions, I would be lying down on the couch, but not Jean-Pierre. He is still not having a pinch. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah. Wow. He does know his name, doesn't he? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, this is Christine. She lives in Abilene, Texas. She suffered from inflammation and pain in her left knee that just kept growing worse. She wore a brace and was not able to walk. While watching this program, she heard you, Gordon, say, someone, you're laying your hand, your left hand on your left knee. There's severe pain on the outside of that left knee. God has touched you and that pain is gone. Do what you couldn't do before. Stand up on that left knee and realize that you have been completely completely healed. After the prayer, Christine noticed the swelling was gone, and so was the pain. Yeah. Hallelujah. Christine touched it, and that story about the tearful eye reached up and touched it and felt a warmth. In an act of faith, reach up and touch that area. If it's at your knee, reach down to touch it. If it's your foot, reach down to touch it. If it's throughout your body, lay your hand on top of your head. Let's believe God for miracles today. Lord, we lift everyone, everyone who has pain, everyone who is suffering, and we declare over them that you forgive all their iniquities. You heal all their diseases. By your stripes, we were healed. We are healed. We will be healed because of what you have done you carried away our infirmities. We don't have to carry it anymore. So Jesus, I leave this with you, knowing that you care for me, knowing that you died for me. I receive it now in Jesus' name. There's someone you've been suffering with Crohn's disease, and it's just a horrible affliction for you. You have your right hand over your lower abdomen on, on the right side. That's where the pain is right now. God is healing your intestines. You no longer have to have this. He's carrying it away from you right now. You just felt that lift off of you. In Jesus' name, be healed and be made whole. Terry? Someone named Lacey, you've been praying about something a long time. God is answering your prayer right now. And a young man, you've had a terrible shoulder injury. You're a basketball player and you think it's going to affect your career, but God's healing that completely for you in Jesus' name. If you've been healed, let us know. Give us a call, 1-800-700-7000. Here's a proverb, you can make many plans, but the Lord's purpose will prevail.